Well, this is the final sermon in our Pressing Questions series. Question number nine, what is the role of the conscience in the Christian life? And I was, as I was preparing for this, I realized uh, how, how, how much this topic is neglected in the church at large today, and so I try to do my best to consolidate all the Bible's teaching on the conscience in 40 minutes. Um, but I'm not going to get to all of your questions. I'm not going to answer all of them in this sermon, um, but if you do have questions, remember, Next Sunday night, um, we'll have a time set aside to unpack further. The Christian conscience. This is a topic, like I said, that's been neglected, and uh, that's unfortunate for two reasons. Number one, because so many of the issues we face in the Christian life are issues revolving around the conscience, whether you realize it or not. The decisions you make, the convictions you have, how you live in community with other brothers and sisters. Number two, it's unfortunate that it's neglected because of the many blessings purchased for us by Christ through the gospel is the gift of a free conscience. Hebrews 10, 19 says this, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Christ, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. So I need you to hear this right off the bat this morning. We have been given freedom, freedom from the guilt of sin, Freedom from the condemning wrath of God. We have been delivered from the bondage of Satan, the dominion of sin, the fear and sting of death, and even everlasting damnation. Christ alone is Lord of the conscience, and he has left it free from human traditions and man-made commandments that are not found in his word such that our consciences are bound to his word alone. And where his word is silent, we are free to act or not to act. The great reformer Martin Luther believed that maintaining a good conscience was even worth dying for. So the Roman Catholic Church excommunicated him for teaching that God justifies sinners by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And at his hearing, here's what he said. My conscience is captive to the word of God. To go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Therefore, I cannot and I will not recant. Here I stand. And he was exactly right in doing so. Because the gift of a free conscience was purchased for us by Christ, it is our responsibility as Christians to guard it. It is wholly right and good to do so. And this is especially true for pastors. Our responsibility before God, as those who will be judged more harshly because we are teachers of his word, James 3, our responsibility is to guard your free conscience and to ensure that we are only binding it in areas where God has spoken. And we dare not go beyond that, lest we inflict spiritual harm and injury on Christ's body. With all that being said, by way of introduction, what do we do as, when as Christians we have disputes and disagreements about issues that the Bible does not explicitly address? Should I pursue this degree or that degree? Should we use birth control or natural family planning? Should I get vaccinated or should I not get vaccinated? Is it a sin for Christians to have tattoos? Is it a sin to watch an R-rated movie? What kind of music is acceptable for Christians to listen to? How do we treat each other? How are we to behave? Does our freedom of conscience purchased for us by Christ have any limits to it? What role does the conscience play in the Christian life? 
And what we tend to want to do as humans is to get a direct answer. Just give me the chapter and the verse. Give me the rule. Give me the law and I'll follow it. Just tell me what I have to do. And certainly we could say the Bible contains within it commands we are to obey. We love him by obeying his commandments, the Gospel of John says. But often, these sorts of issues and questions are left up to wisdom and matters of conscience. And how we behave as brothers and sisters united under the Lordship of Christ indicates whether or not we have a proper and working understanding of the role of the conscience in our Christian life. And God in His grace has not left us in the dark in understanding this issue of conscience. So let's seek to sharpen our understanding of it now. I owe much of what I'm going to share this morning to Andy Nacelli, who's a professor at Bethlehem College and Seminary, and to my former professor, Dr. Ardell Kennedy. First, let's define the word conscience biblically, and then we'll look at Paul's lessons from 1 Corinthians 8 regarding its role in Christian community. So first, what is the conscience? I think when we often hear the word conscience today, we we tend to have uh, one of two things in mind. Either we think of Jiminy Cricket, the grasshopper from Pinocchio, closely resembling a sort of Hindu guru, counselor informing us that we should follow him, do what it says, or we think of the cartoonish depiction of the angel sitting on your right shoulder or the, the devil sitting on your left, the angel tells you what is right, the devil tempts you into wrongdoing. And while we could certainly say there are elements of truth in both these instances, neither of these depictions accurately portray the biblical idea of conscience. Instead, what we can do is we can look at all the times the word conscience is used in the New Testament and look at the descriptive words around it to try and get at a definition. So what are the adjectives that often go with the word conscience when it's used in the Bible? A quick survey will will result in this. The words that go around it include good, so consciences can be good, Acts 23, 1. You can have a clear conscience, 1 Peter 3, 16. You can have a cleansed conscience, Hebrews 10, 22. That would be what we put in the good category, the good kind of conscience. And then there's the not-so-good kind, a conscience that's described as weak, defiled, or wounded, 1 Corinthians 8, 12. You can have a conscience that is evil, Hebrews 10.22, and the worst kind of conscience is having a conscience that is seared, as with a hot iron, 1 Timothy 4.2. All non-Christians have a bad conscience to some degree. They don't have a good conscience, they don't have a cleansed conscience. And this was our predicament before Christ. Before you came to know Christ, your conscience was not properly calibrated to the Word of God. But as, as God's common grace, you probably had some sense of morality, even though it wasn't fully calibrated to his word. And even after we've come to a saving knowledge of Christ, our conscience is still a work in progress. progress. As a Christian, you may have a weak conscience on this issue, and you may have a, con- a strong conscience on this issue. So it's not across the board. There's a spectrum but it's like a muscle that needs to be exercised. Additionally, we see in the Bible the Greek word for conscience, sunatesis, occurring roughly 30 times in the New Testament. And we can best define it as your sense of what you believe what is right and wrong. As human beings made in God's image, we have the capacity for conscience. The conscience witnesses to our moral agency before God, to God's standards, and to our compliance or lack thereof to his standards. But notice I said that the conscience is your sense about what you believe is right and wrong, not what is objectively right and wrong. God has revealed objective truth in his word, so we have revelation about his character and his nature, revelation about what is good and true and beautiful and what is objectively right and wrong. But none of us possesses a conscience that perfectly aligns with his will. 
In other words, we each have individually have consciences that contain personal standards, personal convictions, and opinions that don't match his word. These consciences that we have are often nurtured and formed in the homes that we were raised in, which undermines the importance of our responsibility as parents to shepherd the consciences of our children. And to the extent that we do so well, there will be joy in the years to come. But conflict arises leading to disunity and division in the body of Christ when one person places their personal standard or conviction about something that is not inherently sinful, they equate that with God's word, put it on that level of authority, and they judge other people who are free to do that thing because they aren't acting in accordance with it. We'll talk more about that when we get to 1 Corinthians 8. But continuing to, to unfold this definition of conscience, think of two metaphors. The conscience functions both as a guide and as a judge. So think for a moment about your sense of touch. The nerve endings on your fingertips are part of God's common grace to humanity. The ability to feel pain is God's grace in your life. Because the nerve endings on your fingertips function as a warning system so that when you touch something hot like a stove, what happens? Your nervous system reflexively compels you to pull back in order to avoid further harm. So you touch it, danger, danger. The lights start going off, the sirens start sounding, pull back. All of this happens in a split second. Next time, then, you will instinctively know not to touch that stove again. That's the way the conscience functions. It warns us before we are about to do wrong, and then it judges us after we do wrong, and it brings us a sense of guilt. But even that's the guilt that the conscience brings us is a gift from God, because as Christians, our guilt ought to drive us to Christ. If we do not feel guilty when we sin against God, then that means our consciences are not functioning properly. They are not clean. Instead, they are defiled. So be thankful for the Holy Spirit working through your conscience to bring you a sense of guilt. Why? Not because guilt is intrinsically good in and of itself, but because guilt is an opportunity for you to come again and again to Christ for forgiveness and cleansing from all unrighteousness. The gospel is the power of God for everyone who is believing. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose what? All their guilty stains. All their guilty stains. Praise be to our God. So hopefully that gives you a a grasp on what the conscience is. Now let's shift our attention to the role the conscience is to play in our life together as the people of God. So I hope you still have your Bibles open to 1 Corinthians 8 and the verses that Pastor Chris read for us. We do need to do some background information to set up this text. I'm going to warn you ahead of time, we've got to do some academic work. But if you can bear with me through the details, it's going to serve us well in the long run when we try to uh, apply this passage, okay? So, Acts 18 is the backdrop of the Corinthian church. This is the inception of the Corinthian church. In Acts chapter 18, the author Luke records for us that the apostle Paul, on his second missionary journey after ministering in Athens, arrives in the city of Corinth. The ancient city of Corinth was a thoroughly pagan city, shot through with religious ritual that dominated every aspect of their public life and culture. In fact, archaeologists now have discovered at least 26 religious sites in the ancient city of Corinth. So this was a city filled with temples and rituals and sacrifices to every god in the Greco-Roman pantheon of gods. Zeus, Athena, Aphrodite, Apollos. Furthermore, We know that it was a culture that prized status and knowledge and power and prestige. And it was this world that the Apostle Paul proclaimed that Jesus is Lord. It was to this world that the Apostle Paul entered 
testifying that Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ. That there are not many gods, but there is one true and living God. And Jesus, the Son of God, through his life, death, and resurrection, has made a way for you to be reconciled to this God. Paul proclaimed to the Corinthians the gospel of grace. And Luke, the author, tells us that many Corinthians, upon hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. This group of new Christians then is formed and they become the Corinthian church. And as you can imagine, after being indoctrinated in the Corinthian pagan culture, but then coming to faith in Christ, these new Corinthian Christians had a lot of questions. They had a lot of issues they needed to be sorted out. So they would write to the Apostle Paul in a series of letters, asking him questions. And that's why our text in chapter 8 begins with the phrase, now concerning. Paul is responding to a series of questions they wrote to him. This particular chapter deals with the topic of food offered to idols. You might be sitting there as, as Pastor Chris read it and thinking, why, what is this deal about food and idols and why is that a big deal? Thank you for asking. Okay. Pagan sacrifices were a regular part of life in the ancient Corinthian world. To their dismay, meat was not a regular part of their diet. So it was reserved for special occasions to be eaten in the temple. And there is a whole spectrum regarding in, uh, the manner in which meat would be eaten in the temple. So think of the temple functioning as like what we would call restaurants or banquet halls. It was the gathering place for social occasions. But on the one end of the spectrum, people would eat meat as part of the explicitly pagan religious ceremony in the temple. Paul explicitly forbids that kind of eating meat because the eat in that context was directly participating in demon worship. 1 Corinthians 10, 14. But on the other end of the spectrum, it was there at the temples where social occasions would be celebrated. So birthdays or other important family milestones, family and friends would gather. And to celebrate these occasions, they would bring animal sacrifices to the priest where he would then prepare it for sacrifice. And he would divide up the meat in three portions. The first portion of the meat would be, would be part of the sacrifice to whatever God they wanted to choose offer it to. That was the first part of the meat. It was burned up and consumed. The second, he would keep a second portion of the meat for himself as payment. And the third portion of the meat, he would donate back or sell it back to the marketplace. So what that means is that it would have been very likely for Corinthian Christians to be shopping in the meat markets and to have and eat and purchase meat that had been associated with these false worship. So Paul is addressing this issue this is what he's addressing, and there are two primary groups that have this dispute over this meat that's offered to idols. The first group, primarily Jewish, Jewish Christians who refrain from eating the meat in the marketplace, both for issues regarding kosher, the Old Testament law, and for the meat's association with idols in worship. This group, in our text, is described as having consciences that are weak in regards to this issue of eating meat. Elsewhere in Romans 14, Paul would say they are weak in faith. Their consciences are weak because they are bound to things that God has not commanded or forbidden. So in the new covenant, God has declared all foods clean. But even so, their consciences are bound. And they believe it's sinful to partake in eating this meat that is associated with pagan worship. They feel dirty when they eat this food because of its association with idols. Those of the weak conscience in this instance are prone towards judgmentalism, towards those who are free in regards to eating meat. So they are tempted to bind the consciences of the strong to not eat meat, even though God has not forbidden it. And the heresy that this group needs to be on guard against is that of legalism. They're in danger of adding regulations and rules and requirements to the finished work of Christ. And Paul spent an entire letter in his letter to the Galatians addressing this false teaching. So now that Christ has come, the Old Testament law has been fulfilled. Those dietary laws and food restrictions had served their purpose. So don't go back to that. Don't add that to the gospel and certainly don't require that for these new Gentile Christians. So that issue is settled. Paul's addressed it. That's the first group, those with weak consciences. The second group, 
those whose consciences are strong or free. These are primarily Gentile Christians who have no scruples whatsoever about eating meat from the marketplace. Their consciences are strong or free because they are convinced that God has not forbidden it in his word, so they are free to eat and enjoy to God's glory. This group is prone towards arrogance in their knowledge, in their disposition toward the weak. So we're free, and they're judging those who aren't free because they're proud. And the heresy that this group needs to be on guard against is, this, is the sin of licentiousness. That I can live however I want, no demands on me, because I am free in Christ. Their liberties know no limits. Because they have this knowledge, they have the right to eat in every context, in every context so they think. So do you see the issue? Do you see the collision of consciences for these two groups of people? This is the occasion for which Paul is now addressing. And this is very important for our purposes to grasp this because how Paul goes about dressing, addressing this dispute has everything to do with how we need to be thinking and acting with regard to differing consciences among us. So Paul could have simply just said to the weak, get over it. Start eating meat. Bacon, good. <laughs> right? He could have said that. And this was certainly Paul's position. To the strong, he could have simply said, just cut it out, just become a vegetarian, just keep the peace, just stop. But it's, it's illustrated for us that he doesn't do either. Instead, he reorients their thinking in light of the gospel. How should you then handle your knowledge in light of the lordship of Christ? Since Jesus is Lord, how then should you relate to each other in these matters? Now, in our day, we don't necessarily have disputes over eating meat sacrificed to idols. The closest thing I could think of was when you go into these Asian restaurants and they have those little, you know, Buddha statues usually towards the entryway. They, very superstitious as a way of trying to get prosperity for their business. Um, so we don't have anything explicitly a one-to-one -one correlation, but we do have a whole host of other issues that would fall into the category of what Scripture would call adiaphora, the Greek word meaning disputable matters. So these are matters that Scripture neither commands us to do or forbids us from doing. So we have indisputable matters that ought to bind all Christians everywhere across all time. In fact, two chapters earlier in 1 Corinthians 6, Paul listed some of these indisputable matters. Neither the sexually immoral, nor the idolaters, nor the adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Those are indisputable matters. You cannot persist in drunkenness and call yourself a Christian. We could also add things Official doctrines, orthodox doctrines like the Trinity, the necessity of the atonement, the death and resurrection of Christ. These are indisputable, non-negotiable matters. And, and by way of faithful study of God's word, we can determine what category these belong, issues belong into, whether they're disputable or indisputable. So think about the category, category of entertainment. Whether it's what type of music you listen to or what movies you watch, whether or not you have a Disney Plus or Netflix subscription, whether or not Christians should give any of their business to Disney or Amazon or Target or fill in the blank of any of these corporations that hate Christ. Think of food and drink, whether or not to drink wine, provided you're of legal age, whether or not Christians should smoke cigars, drink fair trade coffee, eat non-organic foods. Think of education, public or private or homeschool. These are all issues today that Christians fight about. Did you know this? We have de deeply held convictions and disagreements over these issues. And to some of weak conscience, certain issues that I just listed would be over the line, i.e. it would be sinful should Christians participate in these behaviors or activities. And remember, your, your conscience can vary from issue to issue. So you may be weak on an issue, you may be strong on an issue. But how are we to relate to each other? How do we treat those whose consciences may differ? 
Three lessons on the conscience and its role in the church from the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 8. So keep these issues that I just listed in your mind as we work our way through these lessons. Here's lesson number one. Knowledge is to be regulated by Christian love. Knowledge is to be regulated by Christian love, verses 1 through 6. Those of strong conscience are correct with regard to some of their knowledge. Do you see that in the text? They are theologically accurate in their knowledge regarding this issue. So specifically in these verses, Paul is referring to their assertion that there are not many gods, but there is one true and living God. They also were correct in saying that idols in and of themselves are nothing. They're just stone. They're just wood. They're not real. We know from 1 Corinthians, later on in 1 Corinthians, that Gnostic thinking was also pervasive in the Corinthian church. So Gnosticism would hold that all physical matter is evil. The body is evil. Everything physical is evil. But everything spiritual is to be prioritized. The spiritual is good. And some of them held this teaching so strongly that they even denied the, resurre- the physical resurrection of the body at the last day. And Paul addresses that later in 1 Corinthians. So this is true. The strong are correct in their knowledge that it is not the thing itself that is sinful. And we could extend this thinking out to other examples. So let's take what, what Paul uses here. He talks about eating and drinking. Okay? Very mundane tasks. Wine in and of itself is not sinful. Wine does not commend us to God. Food does not commend us to God. We are not better off if we drink or eat than if we refrain from eating or drinking. Three texts we have to help our knowledge on this issue from the scriptures. Psalm 104, 14 says this, You, O God, cause grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine, what? What to do what? To gladden the heart of man. First Timothy 4, this one is very explicit. Now the Holy Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. And what do they teach? They forbid marriage and they require abstinence from foods and wine that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. So did you catch that? It's the teachings of demons and those with seared consciences who are forbidding marriage and teaching Prohibitions on certain foods and drink. Last text. Let us not forget that Jesus' first miracle at the wedding at Cana, he altered the molecular composition of water, changing it to grape juice. (laughs) No! He turned it into the best wine that ever was. So let's not be more strict than Jesus when it comes to wine. Let's not fashion for ourselves false standards of holiness and make prohibitions that go beyond Scripture. I mean, it's absolutely astounding to me that Jesus would be excluded from membership in certain church denominations today because of their views on alcohol. And all the sommeliers said, Amen. (laughs) And, And I'm not somebody who has a taste for wine yet. I think I, I want to grow in that area because it's a timeless thing and I think it's good to give ourselves a timeless thing. Um, but my wife can tell you, uh, on our honeymoon, we go to these nice restaurants, I would order chocolate milk, okay? <laughs> Amen. Um, I'm from Wisconsin, you know? Okay. So I'm not like some wine guru over here. Um, where was I? Okay, and I realize that I'm saying this to many of you in this room, this is the reality, right? Many of you in this room have had close family members and friends whose lives were utterly destroyed by alcohol. Entire generations of families left in a wake of destruction due to alcoholic abuse. And yet, 
It's not the wine itself. It's not the alcohol itself. It's not the food itself that is sinful. Paul says in Romans 14, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. It's not the thing itself, but it's how we partake of it that makes all the difference. So if you enjoy wine, do you partake of it with self-control? With thanksgiving? With gratitude in your heart to God? Do you drink a glass of wine to the glory of God? Are you able to do that? Now, all of what I said is true. And the hope is that everyone will eventually fully calibrate their consciences to the word of God on these issues. However, it needs to be said that Paul's primary aim in this passage is not to persuade. It's not to argue on disputable matters. Even though you may have theological knowledge that is true, there is a more important aim for Paul in addressing this issue. So he does hope that we all grow up, we all mature in our consciences and have free consciences on every issue. But that's not reality. We're always going to have weak consciences in areas. There's a greater priority for Paul, and it's the priority of Christian love. Knowledge alone is insufficient if it does not lead to love. If it does not build up your brothers and sisters in Christ, then it profits you nothing. It's puffed up like a balloon, and like a balloon, it's empty. So what's crucial for Paul is not knowledge that allows one to eat. They're free to eat. What's crucial for Paul in these, in these community contexts is love that builds up. Not the way the world talks about love. Love being something sacrificial on your part for the good of another. Love that builds up, brothers and sisters. That's the first lesson. Lesson number two, to act contrary to conscience is sin. Verses seven and eight. Not all are mature in their conscience. Not all have strong consciences in this area, even though Paul says that's the the ultimate goal, but that's not reality. So some, Paul says, probably referring to those recently converted out of paganism, have a difficult time distinguishing the meat from its association with idolatry. And as a result, what does he say in these verses? Their conscience being weak is defiled. So because they were misinformed theologically, they have a weak conscience and they're oversensitive in their conscience. This is why their consciences are weak. So rather than calibrating their conscience to Scripture, they calibrate it according to human traditions and past experiences. The, the one with a weak conscience, for the, for the one with a weak conscience, the focus is always on external rules and regulations. Okay? And this is because rules bring a sense of security. It's something concrete we can point to and say, right here, here's the list, I'm doing this. Everything for people with a weak conscience is black and white. Do not handle Do not taste. Do not touch. Paul talks about that in Colossians. And it's usually, another thing we could say, it's usually the weak in conscience who always voice their convictions the loudest. So they hold, for example, that it's always a sin to watch R-rated movies. Which even that system of of rating movies is is a man-made system. Uh, Can you watch The Passion of the Christ? It's always sinful for Christians to participate in Halloween. It's a sin for women to wear dresses shorter than their ankles. Even if they're well-intentioned, they simply create a man-made standard that goes beyond Scripture, and then they use that as a measuring stick to judge other Christians who are free. But here's the issue for Paul. You need to catch this. This is crucial for our purposes and our life together For those with a weak conscience, it doesn't matter the issue. It is a sin for those with a weak conscience to act contrary to their conscience. It's a sin to act contrary to conscience. Why? Recall what I mentioned earlier about how the conscience functions, like the hot stove analogy. If you act contrary to your conscience, if you disregard the warning signs, eventually you'll form calluses on your fingertips and you will no longer be sensitive to your conscience in other matters. 
matters that are actually themselves sinful. The danger is that if you violate your conscience in this matter, you learn to disobey it in other matters that are much more serious. The conscience is a delicate spiritual organ that is easily damaged. So ignoring your conscience over time eventually leads to having a seared conscience where we no longer feel remorse or guilt for the things that are actually sinful. You just become numb because you've ignored it so long. No longer have a healthy appetite or conviction of sin, and thus you functionally empty the gospel of its power. That's what's at stake. And this is what happens to the consciences of serial killers. They become seared because they've grown accustomed to just ignoring their consciences. This is why we need to be tender and delicate and why great care needs to be given in regards to how we relate to our own as well as the consciences of others. Which brings us to lesson three. Exercise your freedom of conscience properly for the good of others, verses 9 through 13. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you have the knowledge of eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died. Thus, sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. So did you catch how Paul describes those who are weak in conscience in verse 11? What does he call them? Verse 11, the brother or sister for whom Christ died. That's weighty. That's a lofty title. If you insist on your rights and freedoms that you have in certain areas, but you disregard your brother and sister in Christ, you are disrupting the unity of the body of Christ that Christ died to achieve. These are family members purchased by the same blood, united under the same, same Lord. You not only sin against your brother by causing him to stumble and act contrary to conscience, but in so doing, you also sin against Christ. Why? Because Christ alone is the Lord of the conscience. Here's Andy Nacelli. The concern here is not merely that your freedom may irritate, annoy, or offend your weaker brother. If your brother, brother simply doesn't like your freedoms, that's their problem. But if, you practice, if your practice of freedom leads your brother or sister to sin against their conscience, then it becomes your problem. Christ gave up his life for that brother, for that sister. Are you willing to give up your freedom if that would help your fellow brother or sister avoid sinning by acting contrary to their conscience? A point of clarification here needs to be made because we, 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 we exist in time and space and our current cultural moment, the spirit of the age that we inhabit is one where victimology runs rampant. Everybody is offended by everything And everyone is airing their grievances and forcing atonement to be made for said grievances. So those who are offended are are looking for someone or some system to blame for their predicament. And it's increasingly the case in our culture at large that the loudest voices in the room and the most oppressed voices are accommodated for. That's not what these verses have in view. This is not capitulating because someone was offended or complained. This is when your lawful actions, your freedom that you have, causes a brother or sister to sin by violating their conscience. That's what he means by causing others to stumble. And Paul, as our example here, is willing to give up whatever freedom he has in order to avoid that end. I think what's often missed when we're engaged in these disagreements, and this is a great tactic of the evil one, is that we get so hyper-focused on these deceitful matters that we miss the greater reality at stake, the glory of God and the unity of the body of Christ on essential matters. Elsewhere in Romans 14, Paul says, to each his own, let each person be fully convinced in their own mind on these non-essential issues. Whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. We belong to him. Each will give an account of his or her life to the Lord. So quit passing judgment on these disputable matters and do whatever is necessary to avoid spiritual harm to your brother or sister. Understand as well, I think we can miss this in a text like this, that freedom of conscience doesn't require community. All of life, we believe as Christians, is lived before the face of God. 
So what that means is that you can practice your freedom of conscience quietly, privately. If you enjoy a glass of wine, you can enjoy it in private to the glory of God if your conscience is free. That's still exercising your freedom. You don't have to even post social media selfies of you with your Cabernet. Live quietly, mind your own affairs, and enjoy the gift of a free conscience that Christ purchased for you. Okay? That's what we do. And not only do we have in the Bible all this teaching in 1 Corinthians 8, Romans 14, on the conscience, it also gives us an example to follow in the Apostle Paul. Paul goes on in chapters 9 and 10 to list himself as a model for both those inside the church and those outside the church. For the sake of unity inside Christ's church and for the sake of evangelism for those not yet a part of Christ's church, Paul is willing to exercise his freedoms responsibly and strategically for the sake of the gospel. He's a commendable model for us regarding when something was an indisputable matter versus when something wasn't. Because you might be sitting there thinking, well, how do I know if something, which category it falls into? Is this, a, is this an indisputable or is this a disputable matter? Let me close with a series of questions that you can ask yourself if you find yourself unsure in these instances of conscience. So practically, as we roll this out now. So when you're, when you're in an issue or you're in a community and you have a, a question or you're unsure, ask yourself this question, these questions before you proceed. Will this bring glory to God? So many things in our cr- Christian life are simplified when we genuinely ask this question. Will this bring glory to God? Is that my primary aim? Another question. Will this activity or this behavior sanctify me? What conduct will enable me to adorn the gospel, to uphold Christ? What does it mean in this instance that I'm about to partake in to take up my cross and follow Jesus? Will it contribute to preparing me for the new heavens and the new earth? History is not cyclical. History is linear. We're all going towards that end point. We all will stand before the judge one day. Is this activity or this conviction preparing me to live in light of that day? Am I fully convinced in my own mind that this is right? Will it contribute to fruitful evangelism? I'll also put up this chart that I found extremely helpful from Vaughn Roberts. If you're visual, hopefully this is helpful for you as well. But it's basically a recap of what we've unpacked this morning. So does the Bible allow it? No. Don't do it. That's sin. Does the Bible allow it? Yes. Then yes, the question, does my conscience allow it? Remember, it acts... Contrary to conscience is sin. So if, if your conscience doesn't allow it, then don't do it. If your conscience does allow it, if you are free, then ask these three questions. What is the effect on other Christians? Knowing that love is more important than knowledge. What is the effect on non-Christians? The gospel is more important than rights. What is the effect on my spiritual life? Spiritual health is more important than freedom. Let me close with this admonition from Romans 15. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and to not please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written down for our instru- for in former days for our instruction, through endurance and encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Jesus Christ that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brothers and sisters, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, that in Christ you have removed our guilt. You have cleaned our consciences and washed us with pure water. Give us the mind of Christ in these matters when disagreements may arise among us. Help us to have his spirit, his mind, forsaking anything that might disrupt the unity of your church that you bought with your blood. Give us spiritual discernment. Give us wisdom in abundance. Holy Spirit, would you take your word now and apply it to our lives? 
This we pray for the sake of your glory and our good. Amen.